Hello and welcome to coverage of Grand Prix Detroit. This is the quarterfinals. Gabby Sparts with Luis Scott Vargas in the booth. And we have Eric English versus James Zorns. And uh, Eric English being the higher seed, he was the second uh, seed here. He gets to choose where to play first. He uh, unsurprisingly opted to play. Yeah, and he has a good start right here. He gets to play Ancient Syrings right here, reveal a couple cards. Let's see what his choice is. Well, he's looking at basically all the suspects. Uh, he's got uh, <laughs> Thought Not Seer and Reality Smasher there, as well as it looked like some of the some of the lands. So whatever he's missing, Ancient Syrings can find, and that's kind of the purpose of that card in the deck. See what Eric goes ahead and reveals. He has Hand of like World Breaker, Talisman of Impulse, Reality Smasher, and two lands. It looks like so he's deciding w w what will what will combine with those the best. It looks like he's opting for an old Drazi Temple right here. So that's going to be his choice. Ancient Strength to the graveyard and a pass back to James. James is going to leave with a Misty Rainforest. And. I would expect James to start with uh, one of the blue cantrips, whether it's like Serum Visions or uh, something like uh, Gitaxian Probe, which you generally pay for, pay for two life. And uh, he's going to be able to, to try to set up his turn too. And it looks like a Serum Visions. Yeah, so Serum Visions, it's, it's a FNM promo version of it. <laughs> it's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah it's definitely something. Uh, and James is going to leave one of the cards on top? Definitely something. <laughs> 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 All right, so untap back to Eric. It looks like he finds an Oblivion Soul right here. Eldrazi Temple means a talisman of impulse for Eric. Pass back to James. And the the card most relevant in this matchup, game one, for Eric is Thought Not Seer by a lot. It's the card that can disrupt James from winning, especially since uh, Jam James has a slightly faster clock if Eric isn't, you know, doing the old two turn two thought not turn three reality smasher thing, which it does not look like he's doing, mm -hmm. and uh, James is is, you know, this deck's set up to win on by turn four a decent amount of the time, especially if James has a turn two electromancer here and it survives. Mm -hmm. I, I've played various storm decks a lot, though I haven't played this particular list. I haven't. I, I usually have pyromancer sent to my deck instead of gifts, as mm -hmm. I had mentioned before. But if you play a, a, a electromancer and then it, you untap with it next turn, you win the game on the spot. I don't know, 80% of the time. Some some pretty high percentage because Electromancer is a 2-2. It makes all your spells one cheaper. so easy to go off. It looks like we're actually... Oh, no, it's a Mana Morpho, so not quite the Electromancer. <laughs> it doesn't rule it out, though. Yeah, it's true. And I think James might be trying to draw into it. It looks like a... Uh, Thought Scour right here. Yeah, he's not going to play an Electromancer this turn, presumably. So he... Given that, he may have chosen blue in order to just play two two cantrips this turn. Yeah, it looks like it. Gitaxian Probe. Let's take a look at what's going on in Eric's hand. We have a Ghost Quarter, Eye of Ugin, Oblivion Sower, a World Breaker, and a Reality Smasher. No interaction if he does manage to find something like an Electromancer, though. No. Next turn, Eric can play either an Oblivion Sower or a Reality Smasher. And then the turn after that, he can play a World Breaker. World Breaker at least kills a land, but... I think if James is able to even next turn play an Electromancer, he's going to be able to win before he dies uh, fairly easily. It's also worth noting that, uh, you know, Eric's got Ghost Quarters as additional disruption for the mirror, but against James Zorn, really not that effective. He's got three islands and a mountain, so he's able to... I guess you could Ghost Quarter the mountain and just try to cut James off of blue, or red, rather. Yeah, so it looks like a Tom and the f Impulse for Eric, and the Reality Smasher is going to crunch in for five, putting James down to 13. James untaps. And see, even like a follow-up Reality Smasher here, that actually wouldn't kill James. He'd follow three, but he'd presumably be able to, to win on the next turn. He's got, James has gifts on given in hand, so James actually can make a play, which is pretty funny, which is he can play like a land this turn, just pass, and then end of turn go Desperate Ritual Gifts. And then untap, and pr if he's got uh, enough rituals, he might be able to go off. He cast enough spells, cast Grape Shot, and then flash Grape Shot back with Past in Flames. Without Pyromancer's Ascension, how um, quickly can this deck combo off versus the regular Storm deck, Luis? It's, I think, a little bit faster than the regular Storm deck. Pyromancer's Ascension is not even that fast of a card, but it's it's less resilient to disruption. That's mm -hmm. that's part of the problem is that the, the Storm deck with Ascension, it has four Ascensions and four Electromancers, mm -hmm. and if either of them live, they're in pretty good shape. 
this deck is more all in on Electromancer, but I think that's better for this metagame. You'd rather be faster, and you a lot of these Eldrazi decks just don't have that much disruption, so you'd rather just have more rituals, have gifts, and just have more chances to win. So I guess they have the same number of actual rituals, but b the gifts essentially act as extra copies. Mm -hmm. So Gataxian Probe for James. James he already really knows the content of his hand, yep. Yeah, James really doesn't want to fall to 10, because then two Reality Smashers kill him, but he, he can see that Eric only has one, so... Likely James isn't going to die this turn. He he has to expect his land to get world breaker though. He has another Gitaxian probe right there too, so he could put put himself to nine if he chooses to pay with Phyrexian mana. He's gonna play that Steam Vents tapped. There's the goblin Electromancer. And he's at eleven. Uh, so he finds the Electromancer, so now he's just passing it. If Eric doesn't find a way to to, to deal with either the Electromancer or play something like a Thought Knots here, could be tough and <laughs> looks like it might be Eric's day here. That 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 appears to be to me to be a dismember. I thought that's what it was as well. So Reality Smasher comes in and putting James down to six. Ghost Quarter, four mana. World Breaker destroys Steam Vents. Uh, yeah, Exile. Exile, it, yeah. And, and Dismember takes care of the Goblin Electromancer. Wow. That was a brutal draw that step was for James. An incredible draw step for, yeah. Yeah, it's incredible for Eric. Eric <laughs> well yeah. I, I agree <laughs> on that. James is less of a fan of it since he saw Eric's hand. Y you know, that's one of the biggest drawbacks to Gitaxian Probe, mm -hmm. is that it, it just shows you how lucky your you opponent you got. You, you <laughs> get to know when they, when they topped it. Yeah, so <laughs> it's it's a lot less fun to know. Like, if he didn't know Eric's hand and Eric dismembered the, the Electromancer, James could live his life thinking, oh, well, he had an Electromancer. James is not in that space now. Yeah. <laughs> so James has to go off this turn, otherwise he dies. There's two five-power creatures in play. He's at six. So... If he he might be able to lead with Gitaxian Probe. If he draws Electromancer off the Probe draw, I wonder if that's enough to potentially go off. Well, he's certainly thinking about it. He does have that Metamorphos in there, so he will be able to see more of his deck this turn. Let's lead off with Gitaxian Probe. Take two. You know about that Oblivion Sower right there, James. Let's see if you can go off this turn. Looks like an Empty the Warns. I think that's what it is as well. Well, Empty the Warns is interesting. It, it means that... James could go Desperate Ritual, Empty the Warrens, and then get six goblins. And he could even Manamorphose as well, get eight goblins. Mm -hmm. And then, then actually that buys him a significant amount of time. Yeah, so that was a good draw there for James. Maybe not necessarily go off right now, but not be dead the following turn. He plays some Metamorphos, draws another card. The part that's tough is that James has to use a lot of his resources on doing this. So he's not going to be well equipped to go off all that soon afterwards. He still needs to hit an Electromancer. He's like he's not going to have that much time. He's not going to necessarily be able to play the gifts, though. You know, with eight goblins in play, neither the he gets to block the World Breaker with one, go to mm -hmm. seven goblins, and block the Reality Smash with five goblins. Since it is trample, you can't just chump it, and that leaves James with two goblins in play against an Oblivion Sower and a World Breaker, which then chump the next turn. So. James may have bought himself two turns here. Yeah, and the other thing to consider is, yeah, even though it doesn't leave him in the best position to maybe combo out the next turn, this definitely beats dying, so... <laughs> yes, <laughs> uh, drawing that Empty the Worms was important. Yes, it was It was very important draw step there for James. We see a pass back to Eric. There's an Oblivion Sower. We know about that one. Talisman is going to... Oh, it's an Ancient Stirring. So let's see what Eric can find on the top of his library. There's a Kozilex return. Well, that, that'll do it. It's no wow. Sandstorm, but it will kill all of the goblins. <laughs> all right, Kozilex return. Gets played. Takes care of all the goblins. That was a huge find and attack, and that's game for Eric English. <laughs> Eric's deck treated him nicely those last two turns. Yes, he it was fantastic. I mean, Nation Stirrings, look at the power. That was a really cool thing about when Kozilek's Return got printed. It was noticing that you could find that spell with Ancient Stirrings. Very, yeah. very neat interaction. My favorite Ancient Stirrings play of the weekend has to be the Ancient Stirrings into a mist because of the Painter's Servant. Because of the Painter's Servant? <laughs> yes. I feel like we all learned so much from that. <laughs> I, I, I certainly did. It sounded like you did, and I'm sure Matthias Hunt <laughs> <laughs> also learned it. Not, not, I can't blame him. I didn't know the interaction until it was cast either, but that was Ben Rubin's plan uh, as we saw it in the Swiss. Yeah, it, it, wor it worked out pretty nice. Although, actually, did Matthias go on to win that match? He did. He did. So <laughs> it, was a, it was a lesson learned cheaply. <laughs> you know, the, 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 cart the things that stick with you are, are the times when you, you, you make a mistake, and th that's a good way to learn. But you don't want to pay for that mistake with a match loss. You'd rather just, you know, make it in a game where you're going to win anyway. Mm -hmm. The lesson was definitely learned. So we're going to move on to our match between Jerry Thompson 
and uh, how should fun. And Jerry looks like he does not have access to very many cards. He has to have Mulligan this game probably multiple times. So Jerry, if he finds another double land, he's got a Reality Smasher in his hand. He can attack for 15 with those Mimics mm -hmm. and just hope that uh, his opponent just doesn't play anything else this turn. Let's see, w let's see what how Shand is. All right, I think this is a Moldrazi Sky Spawner. It's going to make some nice blockers right here. That does make things a little more difficult. All yeah. right, Jerry, let's see what you've got. Jerry's under a lot of pressure here. I have Ugin or a Drazi Tempo. And a Drazi Sky Spawner. And I think Jerry is actually dead to trample. Because he's got... He can, he's cause Sky Spawner can block Sky Spawner. Token can block Token. He can double block the Reality Smasher. And then and he, he takes go three. To yep, go yep. to zero. He has no other way to interact, does he? I don't believe so. No, his hand is Drowner, Reality Smasher, and he, and he cannot cast either of them right yeah, now. Yeah, this looks like a game that's going to go to Huang. And Jerry knows it. Juan is up a game versus Jerry Thompson in the quarterfinals. Blue-White Eldrazi versus Blue-White Eldrazi. Looks like we may be moving to... Yeah. And we're moving over to the match of Ralph Batesh versus Ronnie Rittner. Looks like Abs and Company versus Red Green Eldrazi. And Abs and Company up a game here. Uh, it's... One of the few non Odrazi decks in the top eight defending the honor of the, the rest of the world. And uh, <laughs> 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 worth noting, there's an Urborg in play. That Virgin Catacombs being tapped for mana is, in fact, legit. All right. So taking a look at their deck lists, this is another one of those go big Eldrazi lists. Yeah, and the two red-green decks that made the top eight were both kind of in that style. We've seen this matchup a lot this weekend, Abs and Company versus a flavor of Eldrazi. Who do you think it ended up favoring it? We, we've actually seen Abs and Company deck have quite a bit of success. Yeah, it seems like, you know, it, it's funny when, you know, when we do coverage, we have this kind of like fishbowl view where oh yeah. we, we, see t the, we see the matches that get played in the feature match area, but we largely do not see the matches that don't. You know, we might hear the results, but we might see Abs and Company beat Eldrazi the majority of the time, which I believe is what we did mm -hmm. from the booth. But there are six Eldrazi decks in the top eight and one company deck. So yeah. I don't know how that fares in proportion to the how those decks were played, though. Because if half the field is Eldrazi, that makes a lot more sense. Or if half the, t the, the top 100 right, was Eldrazi. Right, because half the field is an Abs and Company, so it's less likely to be as represented. So Ronnie actually tapped their two mana for that um, Endless one, which is interesting because we know he has a Dismember in hand. And now Ralph can definitely get a raid for that as well. And that also lets Ronnie leave up Relic of Progenitus because... It might be the case that he needs to, to pay one to exile everything. Tapping to get a, to get one card is usually pretty good, but having the extra mana up is critical. Mm -hmm. So Thought Knots here is a draw for Ronnie. And Ronnie here with none of the lands that he actually wants to see. These are all regular lands, none of the ones that tap for two. And his hand is just jam-packed with Eldrazi. Mm -hmm. So Ronnie's got the one dismember. He's got Thought Knot. Thought Knot, World Breaker, Reality Smasher. Can't cast any of them. He has to give a little bit of thought to just sacrificing the Relic to draw a card. But for right now, it looks like he's not going to. All right, so Ralph's going to go ahead and crack that Windswept piece. Gets him down at 21. Relic of Progenitor is being very good right here in this kind of matchup. Temple Garden is a, draw is a land for Ralph. And we've seen this company deck get some pretty explosive draws. One of the reasons uh, Ronnie's leaving up mana every turn is that Ralph could just go Viscera Seer Court of Calling very easily and, mm -hmm. and just go for the win. So, I mean, there's a Relic of Progenitus in play. That makes it a little a little more difficult. But the two copies of Kitchen Finks means that you actually get to play around Relic. And it's really the Dismember that's stopping Ralph. Mm -hmm. And he potentially doesn't have those combo pieces in hand. But the Dismember it w would break up the combo if he did have it. And Ronnie wants to play in such a way where he is being very mindful of that and that's how he's been playing so far this game <laughs> we have seen company decks play around dismember for many yes. turns that, <laughs> that, that was uh, our, our top eight winner then indeed we did noble hierarch is the play for ralph this turn all right kitchen Fix is gonna rumble gotta be tempting to block with matter reshaper because that just gets you closer to the lands you want to hit. In fact, if I'm Ralph, I'm not even super happy about, about trading attacking for it. Yeah. Here? yeah, that's what I was thinking. 
So Kitchen Finks comes back with a Persist Counter. The Matter Reshaper also is going to get to flip and a card right here. And they're pointing out that uh, because it's not Ronnie's turn, he, his ability is going to resolve first. The Kitchen Finks Persist goes in the stack, then the Matter Reshaper ability. So first we reshape Matter. Ooh, that's a spicy one. Can Ralph put that, or Ronnie put that into play? Does that cost three or less? <laughs> <laughs> no, but is he sitting, he's, he's waiting to be put in, into the battlefield. Yeah, like put me in, coach. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be a while before Ulumog hits it. And uh, Ronnie of note chose not to sacrifice his relic of progenitus, so he let the kitchen finks come back as a two one instead of using the relic. What do you think? Uh, wh why would he do that in that situation? It seems like he wants to conserve the relic for as long as possible mm -hmm. and make it that much more difficult for for Ralph to go off through it. So Ronnie in a bind here. He's he's got four mana. He could cast Thought here, but instead he's passing because he's worried about Ralph going off. Because even even the thought not would take a card out of Ralph's hand if Ralph has like double court of calling, then all of a sudden that he he would just win on the spot. Mm -hmm. All right. So the second kitchen thinks the one without the persist counter is gonna get in. And that gets to heck for four now because uh because of the noble. Exalted, hierarchy. yeah. That's pretty nice. So pass back to Ronnie. Ronnie finds a ghost quarter. Not another old drowsy land, but it is a land nonetheless, and he has a lot of. A lot of Eldrazi in his hand waiting to come out. And that does let him cast the Thought Knot with Dismember Up, which is I think exactly what he was waiting for. Mm -hmm. So here comes Thought Knot Seer. Let's take a look at what's going on in your hand, Ralph. Yeah, I would like to see too. Mm -hmm. Path, path to exile, Kitchen Finks, and an Eternal Witness. So Eternal Witness, not as effective facing a Relic of Progenitus. Not that Ralph even has anything he could bring back. I guess he could have cast the Paths. Can expect to see a Path on Thought Knot potentially. All right, well, while Ronnie thinks about his choice right here, we're going to head back to our first match. Let's watch Storm once again. We're watching Eric English versus James Sorns, and they are currently in game two. Blue-Red Storm versus Red-Green Eldrazi. Leading with, like, a Taxium Probe. Let's see what's going on in Eric's hand. Looks like a, a Seal of Primordium. Mm-hmm. And a couple of Thought Knot Seers and a Talisman and a Nurborg. That's actually really good for, <laughs> for James, is... Despite this being the top eight, Eric brought in Seal of Primordium potentially for Pyromancer Ascension. Though, it, because James has three Blood Moons in his sideboard, it, this could be a proactive measure of for Eric to stop Blood Moon. One of the advantages of playing this Red Green Eldrazi list, by the way, is it doesn't care about Blood Moon quite as much. It's got Talisman of Impulse as a source that provides colorless even through a Blood Moon. Mm -hmm. That does seem pretty beneficial, especially since Blood Moon was one of the ways that people wanted to try to attack the Eldrazi deck. So having something like Talisman it does does seem pretty good in that situation. Steam Vents is the land for James. Let's pass back to Eric. <laughs> it looks like James brought in Shattering Spree as well, that which. Again, I think these players actually do have information based on how they're sideboarding. They either know the deck list or maybe they actually got them in the top eight. Mm, they, get the de they get the deck list they in the top they eight. They get th because yeah. sh Shattering Spree is an answer for Chalice of the Void, which Eric has access to three of. All right, so there's a seal. Seal of Primordium for Eric. And it's worth noting that even a Chalice on one, you can play Shattering Spree and then play the pay the Replicate cost, and then the Replicate copies don't get countered by Chalice, though the original will be. Which of these players do you think uh, benefits more from boarding right here? Uh, my assumption is that is that Eric actually gets a little better after board. Chalice of the Void and Relic of Progenitus and Lightning Bolt are all cards that are fairly effective against James, though I guess you don't really want to board in Chalice in a bunch of one drops <laughs> given that you want a Chalice for one. But, you know, a card like like Blood Moon, which actually James ha has in his hand, first of all, I, I don't think it gets around the, the Talisman of Impulse all that well. Also, Eric does have a Seal of Primordium, which is looking pretty good here. Yeah, so Blood Moon for James, but there's still that Seal over on Eric's side of the battlefield. Seal's going to sacrifice. Down goes the Blood Moon. Eye of Ugin and Thought Knots here. Very nice turn here for Eric. Yeah, the drawing that Eye of Ugin was, was, was quite good. Let's see James' hand. Uh, James is not close to going off at all. His hand is two Shattering Sprees, Bastion Flames, and a Grape Shot. Like, he just doesn't have any 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 fast mana or any card draw. Yeah, and if you're James here, you can't be feeling good about this hand. No, I think I think James is going to have an uphill battle here, especially since there's uh, another Thought Knot Seer in, in Eric's hand. <laughs> Funnily enough, Eric could have played Talisman of Impulse. Mm-hmm. 
<coughs> this turn, but and then still play the Thought Knot because of Urborg, but didn't, which actually ends up playing around the Shattering Spray. <laughs> he did find a land off the top. It's a, I think it's a flooded strand. <laughs> yeah, James is both flooded and stranded. I will agree. <laughs> Yeah, one of the one of the disadvantages to playing a deck like Storm. I, mean, I think the deck's awesome. I really like playing Storm, and I think it's a very good deck. Mm -hmm. But such a highly synergistic deck. When it gets a bad draw, its draws are really bad. Like James, I mean, it's like is, this, right? Is just yeah, not <laughs> close to winning this game. He, the sequence of draws he needs. I guess the addition of Gifts Ungiven is pretty good. Gifts by itself might be enough to pull him out of this, but with what he has currently, he's not going to be able to mount much of a, a defense at all. Yeah, and Eric has an old Drazi Temple too, so he can start deploying a lot of things in his hand right here. Talisman comes first. Down comes Thought Nuts here. More than likely hitting the past in flames if that's still the... the or the, Sorry, that already got hit. More than likely hitting the Grape Shot. Just cleaning up here. Yeah, so Grape Shot down. Just two copies of Shattering Spree on the land at this point for James. James is going to crack the Misty Rainforest, putting him down to 16. Uh, 16 is a lot worse than 17. Uh, my, my inclination is to not be on a two-turn clock by Thought Nuts here, but uh, I think James is in a pretty tough spot either way. Alright, so this is going to be a big draw step for James with the gifts I'm given. The Sulphur Falls. Blooded Strand is a land and a pass back to Eric. And that was the turn where James needed to cast gifts, so he could take a hit down to 8, end of turn, cast gifts, untap, potentially go off, even though I still think that would actually be difficult. And James is just not in a position to come very close to doing that. Yeah, so the Ancient Stirrings. Finds a couple of old drowsy, nothing with haste. He takes, Eric is going to take that endless one. Put the rest at the bottom of his library. In comes the endless one. Crashing for eight, putting James down at eight. Yeah, and I think he's going to... Eight, eight, endless one. Yep. And here I would definitely sack the fetch, because at this point you're, you're facing way more than lethal no matter what. I have Ugin tapping things to Urborg. Look at that combo. Is there anything that James can draw here at this point? Because he couldn't draw gifts, but he can't go off. I, you know, honestly, I do not think so. I think James is going to look at his next card and maybe uh, wish, wish he had drawn a little better in the top eight. He, I think he was on the, on, on the end of some unfortunate draws here. All right. Draw step. Let's take a look, James. It's a blood moon. Plays a blood moon. <laughs> He sent a message. All the lands around. I, I appreciate the message. Eric couldn't untap faster. In they come, and that's match. Eric English moves on to the semifinals over James Sorns. The red green old continue. The menace continues, and blue red storm players weep around the world. Let's take a look at one of our other matches. We have uh, Ralph Batesh versus Ronnie Rittner. Abs and Company versus Red Green Eldrazi. And we actually left this game in progress. This looks like the same game. It looks like... Indeed. <laughs> it looks like Ronnie finally did end up using that Dismember, but Ralph isn't actually that close to dying either. And it looks like he did use that Relic of Progenitus at some point too, but there's a new one in the battlefield. And this is game two, just to remind everybody at home. Right, I think this Eternal Witness might be on the stack right now. Maybe not. I wonder if Ralph's considering attacking with it. It seems like a like a bold attack, <laughs> unless, he, unless he wants it in the graveyard. Sometimes for some you get up with the, put the f no fear. There you go. Blocks reality smasher. All right, court of calling. Oh, so he wanted to. Now he's going to cord for a murderous red cap. To finish off the reality smasher, mm -hmm. presumably, because the eternal witness got exalted from noble hierarch. And if you're Ronnie there, that looks suspicious, right? Would you still go for it? He's going to have to discard a card for this, but he well doesn't have any in his hand. Well, Redcap actually gets around that because it's an ability. Oh. So, so, so Ralph was able to, to dodge the, the downside of targeting the, the Reality Smasher. So Ronnie wouldn't be surprised if he thought something like that might happen, but you can't just take three. He's at eight. Going to five yeah. is a little ambitious. Well, luckily for Ronnie, he's got two World Breakers and he still has that Ulamog. Ronnie still hasn't found an Eldrazi land. 
But if he d it looks like he's cracking the relic to try to look for one. Mm -hmm. So he's going to cycle that relic. Away go all the graves. He found an Urborg. Not an Eldrazi land, but is a land nonetheless. There's a Kozilek's return is a draw for him. <laughs> Ronnie can play the Urborg. He has to tap his first Urborg, play the second <laughs> Urborg, sacrifice one of the Urborgs, but then he gets to cast Worldbreaker and at least start getting onto the board. Any uh, any appetite for casting Kozilek's return right here? Oh, let's see. Yeah, that actually looks pretty good too. You kind of wish you had Relic of Progenitus left because that would stop Finks and Redcap from coming back. But if Ronnie goes, go, just says, just do, ha, makes no plays, next turn casts Kozilek's return just to make sure, you know, at the end of Ralph's turn or something mm -hmm. along those lines. Then next turn plays Urborg Worldbreaker to finish off the Persistent. Yeah, and then and flashback, or not flashback, but Kozilek's return, but basically. All right, Kozilek's return takes care of a lot of these creatures. Some of these come back. Red Cat comes back. Kitchen Finks comes back. Two persist triggers. Red Cap not quite big enough to, to finish off the Thought Knots here, which did take two damage. So the disadvantage to doing it main phase, as opposed to say something like Sorcery Speed, is now Ralph can attack with one of his creatures. But though there aren't that many draws that make that an appealing proposition. Yeah. So now it's back to Ralph's turn. Sin Collector <laughs> from Ronnie. A turn too late. Uh, Ronnie already sinned. He's got the <laughs> Kozilek's return in the graveyard. <laughs> right, and there's nothing, no targets here for Ronnie. He does get information about Ronnie's hand, but unfortunately, he's not going to be able to take anything. <laughs> it's not good information. It's the information that World Breakers start coming down. And Ulamog. Yeah. Just mm. Sitting there. Ulamog, not that many turns away. Sitting there ready to go. All right. Ralph is going to get in with both creatures. And part of the incentive for doing this is that if you think that Ronnie's going to play World Breaker to recast Kozilek's Return from the Graveyard, you might as well get a point in. The downside is that Ronnie doesn't actually have to trigger the Kozilek's Return. It is a May, so... Is there a chance that he just doesn't want to at this point? Yeah. Killing off your own Thought Knots here to kill a Wall of Roots, a 1-1 one -one Red Cap, and a Sin Collector, and then letting Ralph draw a card, that doesn't sound great to me. He did draw a land, so he's not going to have to play a second Urborg out. <laughs> yeah. Here comes seven mana World Breaker. Oh, he's picking them up, but he hasn't decided yet. He's wait a yeah, second. Yeah, I, I don't, I don't think Ronnie is actually necessarily in for uh, in for casting Kozlek's return. Yeah, so he's going to exile that. I that like that too. It. Yeah. This is nice. He also gets to keep it for. He has a second one, so if at, uh, at any point this game kind of gets out of hand, he can just go for it again. Yeah, that's a that's a huge advantage. He drew a lightning bolt this turn. <laughs> so, R Ronnie looks like he's going to use the double Urborg play to play World Breaker, but also just have a red mana tap just in case. <laughs> All right, yeah, so here you go. One mana floating, one red mana up just in case. World Breaker targeting the second Overgrown Tomb. It's reduced Ralph to a single black source, but still has five white sources and three green sources, plus a wall root. So Ralph's doing all right on mana still. So the World Breaker is going to rumble. The Thoughtnots here is going to sit back on defense. Ronnie wants, wants to make sure he doesn't die to anything unpredictable at this point. Yeah, and it can't even get past the wall route, so he's, he's better off just kind of leaving that behind. It's funny, the World Breaker land exiling part has actually just not been relevant this game, so there's six mana five <laughs> or seven mana five sevens. Ronnie finds an Ancient Stirring, so let's see what he finds on top of this. Ooh, there's a Reality Smasher and a number of lands. But they're not even the double lands. Nope. There you go. Reality Smasher comes back in. He still has one left up. All right, everyone gets in. And Ralph, or Ronnie's hoping that Ralph just blocks Wall of Roots on Thought Nuts here, takes 15, then gets finished off by Lightning Bolt. Because even the thing is, he did telegraph the Lightning Bolt a little bit by playing the Urborg so he could leave Mountain untapped. Mm -hmm. Ralph, I think, should be at least considered a possibility that there's a Lightning Bolt. But Yeah, and that was the block, and Ronnie's going to go ahead and cast that Lightning Bolt, putting Ralph down to zero. Ronnie evens out the game, one to one. They're going to move on to a game three here. Taking a look at these players' sideboards, Luis, um, do you think either of them improve? Is there anyone that do you think has a big advantage here? Ronnie is basically pre-boarded. I mean, he gets to board in those relics of progenitus. Mm -hmm. Th those are useful. I think that they're, they're a good sideboard option. But... Other than that, I mean, he's got four Kozilek's return in his main deck. That's just the best card. He's yeah. got the three lightning bolts already. Those are pretty good. 
So I don't think Ronnie changes all that much. Ralph gets to board in. Thoughts if he wants it, path to exile if he wants it. He's got an intrepid hero, so that's, <laughs> that's <laughs> one you haven't seen in a while. That's so. a spicy one. Yeah, it's two and a white for a 1-1, one, one, and you can tap it to destroy a creature with power four or greater. So it just sits in play, gunning down Eldrazi. Though it does die to Kozak's turn, Lightning Bolt and Dismember, it's still, while in play, a very big threat. Yeah, it's pretty nice if you ever get to go collected company, find intrepid hero, and then he starts just gunning down for the Eldrazi. It's pretty, pretty sweet if he actually manages to pull it off. Yeah, and it, it, it seems like an effective sideboard card. Also, it looks like... Uh, Ralph brought in Sin Collector since it's not his main deck and we saw him cast it that game. Again, that's a concession to Kozak's Return. Kozak's Return is a pretty impactful card in this matchup. It looked pretty good that game and having targets of like Ancient Stirring, Lightning Bolt, and Dismember to hit is just a bonus. We also saw that copy of a Sin Collector. <laughs> Looking pretty good. Unfortunately, that game he didn't take anything, but... No, it was... <laughs> there, there not much was collected there. It was ended up being uh, kind of a whiff. Yeah, there are a lot of things that it can find, so that, that is nice for the one card, especially since he can tutor it up um, with any of his hordes of calling. It's possible that Ralph wants something like Revelark if he expects a longer game, more attrition-based game, but not 100% sure about that one. How, 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 I mean, it add some level of resilience, right, to Cold Luck's return? It does. It, it, it does br give you a way to bring things back. But it's kind of annoying that you side in this 5-drop that if your opponent, you know, kills it, they, you get two creatures back, but they're also siding in Relic of Progenitus. You saw two that game. Mm -hmm. I don't really want to cast Revelark and then have my opponent just go Relic, Relic your Graveyard, Lightning Bolt, your Revelark. That's just not a very good exchange. So if you had to name uh, uh, who you think is going to come victorious from this, Luis, who would you, you bet on? I think that Ronnie's got an advantage here. Just having the four the four Kozlux return is so big. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it looks like uh, Kozlux return is pretty good against the field, too. I mean, there was a lot of affinity, a lot of things like abs and company, uh, elves. It's very good against elves. So, yeah, that's I think that's part of the reason that we've seen this red green Eldrazi kind of gravitate towards the top and coming into this top eight. It even has utility against blue white Eldrazi, though. A lot of times you have to cast the first part of it for very little effect, but then you hope to play World Breaker and kill all their creatures. So this time Ronnie does have that Eye of Ugin. I mean, he drew a second one, which is not really what he wanted to see. No, that is definitely not ideal. Yeah, so Noble Hierarch for Ralph and a pass back to Ronnie. Ronnie can kill the Noble on turn one. He chooses to go for a Relic of Progenitus instead. What do you think about that? I would be really tempted to Lightning Bolt Noble Hierarch. It's pretty hard to get away from just killing a turn one mana creature. And it doesn't look like Ronnie has a Kozlux return in hand, because that would be one of the reasons not to. Godless Shrine is going to come in to play untapped. I think. Oh, Phyrexian Revoker. Wow. Yeah, naming the Relic and another Noble Hierarch from the Noble Hierarch. Ralph Pass just all, all in on just Kozlik's uh, return not being a card. Well, so far we know that Ronnie does not have it, so it's going to have to close out this game fast. Endless one coming in for two. And a pass back to Ralph. Hmm. The Endless one for two doesn't actually stop the Revoker because of the double Exalted trigger, so Ronnie's going to have to either bolt the Noble or just bolt the, the Revoker. All right, so three mana Kitchen Finks, putting Ralph back up to 20. Viscera Seer. Ralph's only one card short of the Malira combo, mm -hmm. and he has Revoker stopping that Relic. Horizon Canopy and a pass back to Ronnie. Do, you, do we know if uh, Ralph has anything like uh, Court of Calling or Collected Company? Because that would be very exciting. Yeah, that doesn't look like that's his last card. Ronnie has the ability to Lighting Bolt the Revoker and then to unlock the Relic, but he needs, he needs another land. It actually, I don't think I don't know if Ronnie has a non-eye land in his hand. Is he attacking with a Revoker? I think he is. Yeah, it looks like it, and it'll be a four-three thanks to the uh, Noble Hierarchs. All right, so there's a bolt. Gonna take care of that Revoker. Ralph Don't is gonna sacrifice and be able to scry from the Viscerous here. Yeah, and that that makes me a lot less happy about bolting it 
at that time, I think I would I would be a lot more happy about bolting it in like response to the viscera here if you think you're gonna have to bolt it anyway. Though since we're off scratch to the top, no there no harm was done. Yeah. So Ronnie found the Kozak's return. That yeah. is that is in his hand, but he's he two did not find a land though. Yeah, he's two men away from casting it. He needs to find draw Urborg exactly to make it so his eye taps for uh, black man and can cast Kozak's return. Kitchen Finks coming in as a 5-4. Noah Herrick yeah. has a lot of extra value. All right, and if you're Ronnie here, are you just waiting to hopefully hope that Ralph commits more to the board and then you're able to route some of the stuff away, or are you just going to, yeah. Looks like he's going to fire off that dismember. Ralph has a response. He's going to abrupt decay the relic now that Ronnie is tapped out. Interesting. And so then the relic dies, which means when the Finx dies, he gets to come back without fear. Mm -hmm. All right, so he comes back with a persist counter. He takes no damage, but now he has no relic. So Ralph's definitely ahead here. He's got a lot of mana. He's got now just the Viscerous here, since the Finx is no longer like in combo mode. Mm -hmm. But... He's on a clock. If Ronnie draws lands, Ronnie can cast Kozak's Return pretty and soon. Ronnie found an Ancient Stirrings, which presumably can find a land right here. Hopefully, an Eldrazi land. <laughs> he found no land. Presumably, he can find a land. Yes. <laughs> I recant my previous statement. There are no lands here. There's a Graph Digger's Cage. Stage, yeah. That card is good, but wow, it's really not what Ronnie needs. He's going to start dying to these noble, noble backed beats in just a <laughs> second here. All right, so he takes the Graph Digger's Cage. No land for Ronnie. And a pass back to Ralph. Wow, that was savage. Meanwhile, Ralph's sacking his lands <laughs> to draw cards. <laughs> like, must, must be nice be to nice. have so many lands. <laughs> <laughs> so at the very least, the Finks can come in for four. The thing is, Ralph really knows he's got an opportunity here. He's got, he's got access to a ton of mana, and Ronnie's just sitting there, so he really needs to, to press home that advantage. All right, so it looks like one, two, three, four. This looks like a quarter calling if I've ever seen one. Five, yeah. So he's going to tutor something else. This is especially nice knowing that Ronnie does have the Graph Digger's Cage in his hand and not currently in the battlefield. So Cord for two, get Anapenza, and what that does is it gives him all, gives Ralph all the combo pieces. He just needs to play any creature to bolster onto the Finx to make it so when you get sacrificed, he doesn't have a minus one, minus one counter. Yeah, so here we go. Takes that counter off. Going to represent the loop. And Ralph should be a 99 plus life now. There we go. Ralph Katesh at 99 plus. Presumably cuts to a red cap on top of his deck. So it looks like they're, they're short cutting all the scries. No, he did not shuffle his deck. He, mm -hmm. he just got to scry all the bottom to look through it to make sure he has red cap. And Ronnie can see. He can play a Graph yeah. Digger's Cage, which means that, that Ralph can no longer go off. He has an infinite life at this point, though. So how, what's the best way to close out the game from here? If Attacking with a 5-4 Fink every turn will presumably do the trick. Yeah, so the Endless One goes under the bus. Ronnie's still at 14 life, but has no board at this point and no lands. An Ulamog is the opposite of a land right here. Pass back to Ralph. Abrupt Decay going to take care of the Graph Digger's Cage, and that's game. Ralph Batesh is going to take it in three games for the quarterfinals, moving on to the semifinals with Abs and Company. And that's going to do it here for the quarterfinals. We're going to take you to an interview with Eric English. We're going to take you to that interview in just a second. But we're going to get to hear about how the quarterfinals went for Eric. Yeah, and we, we saw one of the non Eldrazi decks advance in the Obzon Company deck, though the uh, Storm deck piloted by James Zorns did unfortunately did not. All right. It looks like this time we are ready. So let's let's. That's it for round, the quarterfinals here at Grand Prix Detroit.
coverage of Grand Prix Detroit. This is Gabby Sparks with Elise Scott Vargas.